Hello everyone, this is Dr. Matthew Kong and today we will be talking about high performance liquid chromatography, which is HPLC. So this technique is quite similar to uh, the previous topic that you have learned in gas chromatography. It's essentially the liquid version of that technique. But of course, as we proceed along, there will be some subtle differences that I would like you to pay attention to. So gas chromatography actually uses uh, inert gases such as helium and nitrogen as the mobile phases. We have learned that uh, separation occurs when the uh, chemical components interact differently with the stationary phase, which is typically a polymer coating on the inside of the gas chromatography column. Now, typically we do not pay much attention to the mobile phase in gas chromatography as we just treat it as a gas that carries the sample molecules through the instrument. Now that is quite different from high performance liquid chromatography because the mobile phase in HPLC actually pay, plays an important role in the separation. So in HPLC, we typically use liquids as the name suggests as the mobile phase. And we need to appreciate that separation occurs as the uh, molecules will interact both with the stationary phase, that is the column, and the mobile phase, that is the liquid that is uh, used to move the molecules along the instruments. And this point is a little subtle, but the mobile phase um, has properties that affect how separation occurs in a HPLC. So this is quite different from GC where there are no uh, impact from the uh, carrier gas. So we take a look at uh, a schematic to describe roughly how HPLC works. Now you should not be too uh, unfamiliar with this concept. On the top schematic, you see a mixture of um, molecules in the liquid form at the beginning uh, of the column and you also have the blue colored liquid which is the mobile phase. Now um, in a few slides uh, ahead we will talk about um, how various properties of these mobile phase can be changed and how it affects the separation in the HPLC analysis. So as we have our sample mixture uh, comprising the green molecules and the red molecules, as the mobile phase and the sample molecules are pumped uh, towards the end of the column, we note that the blue the, that the red molecules and the green molecules start to interact with the yellow circles, which represent the stationary phase or the HPLC column. Clearly, uh, similar to gas chromatography, the green circles and the red circles are interacting to different extents with the stationary phase. So clearly, um, the red circles here interacting more with the stationary phase that's why they are being left behind in the column and the green circles are interacting less with the stationary phase and therefore uh, have a preference for interacting with the mobile phase and that is why they are flowing along quite quickly together with the blue liquid that is the mobile phase so as we progress down the column now we start to see in the top schematic quite a clear uh, distinction between the red molecules and the green molecules. Uh, clearly, as they progress towards the end of the column, uh, separation becomes uh, more and more distinct. So this is also uh, true in, ga in gas chromatography as it is in uh, liquid chromatography. As we progress down the column, and the longer the column is, the more opportunity for separation there is, the greater the uh, distinction between the different types of molecules will be observed. So right at the end of the column, we typically have a detector and the detector will uh, present us with a bunch of peaks that represent the various uh, chemical components or the molecules that are eluting from the column. So in this case, we see that the green molecules will be first to leave the column and reach the detector. So therefore, the chromatogram will show a peak that represents the green molecules 
that's on the bottom uh, graph. And after some time, we'll see that the red molecules will eventually reach the detector, and therefore the chromatogram will show a peak that again represents the um, red molecules. So the terminology that is used in liquid chromatography is actually very similar to that of gas chromatography. The amount of time it takes for the green molecules and the red molecules to leave the column and reach the detector, we also call the retention time. And we give it the same uh, notation, TR. Now this slide presents a typical schematic of uh, the instrument components in a high performance liquid chromatography instrument. I will just highlight uh, three or four key components uh, starting from the left and this is the mobile phase reservoir. So that is just a fancy way of saying that we have one or typically two bottles of mobile phase and uh, these bottles contain the specific chosen mobile phase that we want to use for our experiments. And typically we have a pump that is responsible for uh, drawing out the mobile phase from these bottles and moving them into the HPLC instruments. Of course, as we have seen in uh, gas chromatography, the mobile phase will collect the sample, which is typically in this case uh, in liquid form, and move it towards the column. The column is where the uh, separation occurs. So typically, um, we have various chemical components in the sample mixture. They will interact with the uh, particles uh, within the column. Separation will occur and eventually they will reach the detector at different times. And uh, that corresponds to the various uh, retention times that we talked about in the previous slide. So generally speaking, um, there would be four key components. On the left, we have the uh, solvents, the mobile phase system, followed by the sample injection system, followed by the column, and right at the end of the instrument, we have the detector. And we'll talk about each of these components in a bit more detail as we progress down the slides. Now we'll start off with the mobile phase. The mobile phase is typically uh, two bottles of liquids um, that will be combined together in certain percentages and then move towards the instrument using a pump. Now, the two bottles, typically we have a bottle of aqueous reagent, which is usually water or some sort of um, salt uh, derivative added to the water and dissolved. And uh, we also have a bottle of organic liquid. Uh, some examples include methanol, acetonitrile, uh, ethanol. So these are all considered organic liquids. Um, just by pure convention, we typically label the aqueous phase as mobile phase A and uh, the organic phase as mobile phase B. So this is pure uh, convention in the chemical uh, community. So the mobile phase is typically chosen by the uh, scientists to be certain percentages. So for example, we might use 30% uh, water, 70% uh, methanol, mobile phase to run our experiments. Or we could be using a 75% water, 25% uh, acetonitrile uh, type of mobile phase to run our experiments. And this decision is purely based on uh, what type of sample, what type of chemical components we're trying to separate uh, during the experiments. And of course, there are many, many combinations that are possible. Uh, just to bring about some uh, terminology, we have two types of elution. So the mobile phase can either be fixed throughout the experiment. So for example, if I start off with 30% water, 70% methanol, and I continue using this mobile phase uh, percentage composition throughout the entire analysis, then I call that type of analysis uh, isocratic elution. Isocratic means remains the same throughout the uh, process of elution. But sometimes in some experiments, in fact in most experiments, we will typically change the mobile phase composition 
uh, in the during the course of the experiment. So for example, we might start off using 30% water and 70% methanol, but as we progress to a later point of the analysis, we may increase the water percentage to 50%, for example, and decrease the methanol percentage to 50%. So this type of analysis we say is done with gradient elution. Gradient representing that there is a change uh, in the mobile phase composition uh, at certain points during the analysis. Next, I do want to talk about some of the criteria uh, that uh, HPLC solvents or mobile phases must have. So the first is that the solvents used in HPLC, whether it's water or methanol or acetonitrile, they must be of high purity, 99.99%. And the reason for this is because um, recall that the solvent will actually be flowing through uh, the column, which is a very densely packed kind of system. So if the solvent has uh, even small amounts of contaminants such as metal ions or uh, other types of contaminants, it's very likely that these will be trapped in the column and therefore either uh, cause damage to the column or in a worst case, uh, cause damage to the pump due to the high pressure that is going through the system. So that's the first thing. Uh, when we purchase solvents for uh, use during HPLC, we typically purchase them with HPLC grade. So HPLC grade implies that the purity is sufficient for use uh, in a HPLC instrument and will not damage the instrument. The second is that the solvents used must be degassed. Uh, bubbles and, and small micro bubbles of air must be removed prior to use uh, in the instrument. The good news is that most modern instruments these days are equipped with inbuilt degassing units, which means that the solvents that we purchase, uh, as long as they're HPLC grade, if we start running it through the instrument, it automatically passes through a inbuilt degasser prior to running through the system. Lastly, uh, whenever we run any samples, we typically want to uh, filter them with a um, roughly a half micrometer uh, filter. So this again is to ensure or to be double sure that we have no uh, small particles present that will uh, damage the column or if trapped will cause a lot of high pressure build up in the system, potentially damaging the system. Now, we also mentioned that the mobile phase requires a pump to push the mobile phase uh, through the entire system. So the pump is nothing fancy. It essentially is a peristaltic pump that drives the mobile phase through the system. Uh, it also has, typically in modern uh, instruments, it has an inbuilt mixing uh, capability. So for example, we mentioned we might, run run, we might want to run an experiment with 30% uh, water and 70% methanol. The instruments will draw uh, the required amount of water and methanol from the various bottles, uh, mix it in the inbuilt mixing chamber, such that it's homogenized before uh, moving it through to the instrument. Now, after the mobile phase and the pump system, we reach the sample injection system. And there are two types of systems I would like to briefly talk about. The first is a manual injection loop. What is this manual injection loop? If you look at the pictures below, you see that it is uh, essentially an injection port and right at the end of the injection port, you have a coil of a wire-like structure. This coil of wire-like structure has a fixed volume. So for example, you see here, the fixed volume of the internal uh, portion of this wire is one milliliter. How does it work? Well, we take a syringe and we start injecting our sample into this loop. Clearly, the loop will fill up and contain uh, one milliliter of the sample. Excess sample that we are continuing to inject will flow out into waste. Now, the purpose of this manual injection loop is to control the volume of sample that goes into the instrument. So each and every time, only the sample that remains in this one milliliter loop will be uh, injected into the instrument. So this ensures uh, reproducibility in terms of uh, injection volume. So regardless of whether we 
uh, use our syringe to inject uh, 4 milliliters or 10 milliliters, it doesn't matter because uh, the rest will go to waste and only 1 milliliter will be retained. So of course, there are different volumes of uh, manual injection loops that are available for purchase and uh, you will be using this kind of injection mechanism uh, in your practical experiments. The second type of injection system is an auto injector. So you see here on the right hand side where they have a whole series of uh, vials that contain various samples and the machine is programmed to uh, perform an auto injector uh, of each of those vials uh, in sequence. So this uh, of course allows for much greater uh, efficiency and uh, allows us to, for example, run the instrument overnight when even when we are not present. Now the next part of the instrument is of course the column. The column is uh, similar to a GC instrument and it's also located within a heating element uh, where its temperature is controlled. So in the gas chromatography chapter, we talked about how temperature affects the retention times of uh, chemical components and that is also true in uh, the realm of HPLC. So therefore, the column has to be maintained at a certain temperature typically 30 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Celsius to ensure that the retention times uh, for various chemical components from run to run will remain the same. So make sure that there are no temperature fluctuations as the uh, analyses are run. So you see at the bottom a typical picture of two uh, 15 cm columns and uh, these columns are typically much shorter than those found in GC. Uh, we have 15 cm columns, uh, 30 cm columns, and uh, shorter ones such as 10 and 5 cm columns. So these are the common lengths. So the next part of the discussion, we'll be talking about uh, various types of HPLC columns and how they can um, allow separation to occur. We'll spend a bit of time talking about the first two, normal phase columns. So we call it normal phase HPLC, or when we use reverse phase columns, we call it a reverse phase HPLC. Now for these two types of HPLC columns, when they are used, there is an umbrella term and these two are called partition chromatography. Right? So these two are grouped under a similar umbrella term that's called partition chromatography. Then in the later part of the topic, we'll be talking about the two remaining types of columns, ion exchange columns, and size exclusion columns. Now the first type of HPLC we'll talk about is normal phase HPLC. Now what defines normal phase HPLC? Quite simply, we define this type of HPLC when we use a polar stationary phase. So the particles where the uh, molecules will interact with, they are generally polar in nature. So of course, uh, if the stationary phase is polar, then the mobile phase that we used will be a relatively non-polar. So of course, uh, we need to recall that uh, light attracts light. So therefore, uh, polar molecules will tend to interact with uh, the polar stationary phase more, while non-polar molecules will tend to prefer remaining in the non-polar mobile phase and therefore flow along quite quickly. So if you look at the schematic at the bottom, we can see that as these compounds uh, or these molecules flow through the column, we expect the polar compounds, in this case the green circles, to be uh, retained or uh, interact more with the, with the polar stationary phase. And the uh, non-polar molecules, in this case represented by the red circles, will definitely prefer to remain in the non-polar mobile phase and therefore continue flowing along um, the column uh, until it reaches the detector. So in this case, naturally, we would expect the non-polar molecules to elute a lot quicker than the polar molecules. So this is uh, typically the case in normal phase HPLC. So this uh, verbalizes uh, what was briefly described in the diagram. We talked about how the mobile phase should be non-polar uh, 
And of course, the opposite is also true. Uh, the stationary phase must therefore be a polar type stationary phase. And of course, if the stationary phase is polar, then um, the more polar molecules or the more polar analytes will tend to be retained or interact more with the stationary phase. Typically, during this type of normal phase HPLC, we would start off the uh, mobile phase with a reasonably low polarity. So for example, um, we will start off with a 90% uh, acetonitrile, 10% water type mobile phase. We need to recall that uh, the organic species, in this case acetonitrile, is typically not very polar and water is of course the most polar mobile phase that we can use. So therefore, we want a, a reasonably high percentage of the organic phase and a reasonably low percentage of the water when we start off doing a normal phase HPLC. Of course, um, as the analysis progresses, we can use gradient illusion, uh, the mode of operation, to increase the amount of water and therefore increase the polarity of the mobile phase uh, in order to elute the very polar species that uh, cling on to the stationary phase and refuse to uh, leave the column. Now, when we look at uh, normal phase HPLC, we need to think about the polarities of the various species and also the columns in order to determine their elution order. So earlier we mentioned that normal phase HPLC is purely defined by the stationary phase being polar. So therefore, we would expect the very polar things to be highly retained on the column. So they will spend a lot of time interacting with the column, the stationary phase. And we would expect the uh, compounds with low polarity to not interact very much with the stationary phase. So it says here that the least polar compounds will elude first. So that makes sense to us because the least polar compounds will prefer to be in the mobile phase and have not much interest in interacting with the polar stationary phase. So if we look at our chromatogram, we will expect the molecules that are not that polar to elude quite quickly. So they'll be on the left-hand side of the chromatogram or very low retention times. And as we uh, progress along, we'll see the more and more polar compounds being eluted. So of course, um, both sentences are true. You know, the least polar molecules elude first and the most polar molecules elude last. So that is the reason why uh, earlier I mentioned gradient elution, whereby if you have a very polar uh, compound, in this case, compound number five, um, the presence of this compound on the column makes the analysis time very, very long because it refuses to leave the column. It likes to interact with the column so much, right? So therefore, it is somewhat important for us to, towards the end of this analysis, to increase the polarity of the mobile phase so as to push this uh, compound out, to make it uh, more likely to go with the mobile phase and essentially leave the column. So we do this in order to uh, moderate our analysis time. Right? We do not want our analysis time to be uh, quite so long, say 30 minutes. We might be able to reduce it to 20 or 22 minutes if we uh, use gradient illusion. So the second type of HPLC is known as reverse phase HPLC. This is exactly the opposite of normal phase HPLC. And recall that earlier I mentioned that both these types of HPLC are grouped together and called partition chromatography. So in reverse phase HPLC, it is characterized by a non-polar stationary phase. And of course, the opposite is true, so we need to have a, rel a relatively polar type of mobile phase. So similarly, the um, mode of operation is the same. We have our green molecules and our red molecules, and as they travel down the column, of course, um, for the non-polar stationary phase, it will attract these uh, non-polar molecules or non-polar compounds. So the non-polar molecules and compounds will be highly retained on the column, they'll interact more with the uh, non-polar 
stationary phase, so therefore they'll take a longer time to leave the column. While the polar compounds uh, have no interest in interacting with the non-polar stationary phase, right, because their nature is different, so therefore we expect that the polar compounds will flow along quite quickly with the uh, relatively polar mobile phase and therefore be eluted from the column uh, quite a lot quicker. So this is, of course, exactly the opposite as normal phase uh, HPLC. So uh, when we consider reverse phase uh, HPLC columns, we tend to use a relatively polar mobile phase. So this is to contrast with the uh, non-polar stationary phase that the analytes will be retained on. So typically, we would start off with a reasonably polar type mobile phase. So this is just an example, right? We're talking about 80% water, which is a very polar uh, substance, and 20% of the organic methanol. So um, of course, as the analysis progresses, we may uh, decrease the polarity of the mobile phase so as to make sure that the uh, species that are very highly retained on the column uh, can leave the column within a reasonable time so as not to make our analysis time uh, incredibly long. So if we look into the literature, we might see that uh, sometimes columns are, are known as a C6 or C8 or C18 columns. So these are actually just columns whereby the stationary phase is made up of uh, carbon chains that are six carbons long or eight carbons long or 18 carbons long or whatever. Now, typically the length of the carbon chains doesn't really matter. What's important for us to know is that carbon chains are by nature a very non-polar. So therefore, these types of columns uh, with uh, carbon chains as stationary phase will typically uh, be non-polar columns and therefore when we use these columns we consider this type of HPLC to be reverse phase HPLC. So very good for uh, non-polar uh, type compounds to be retained and separated on these columns. So as we have uh, described earlier in normal phase HPLC, we can also consider the elution order of uh, various compounds in reverse phase HPLC based on their polarity. So it's essentially the opposite, right? Because we know that the stationary phase is non-polar. So therefore, um, the least polar analytes will always spend a lot of time interacting with the column. So therefore, we expect the least polar compounds to be eluted the latest. And the most polar species have no interest in interacting with the stationary phase, so they will just happily flow along uh, with the mobile phase and be very quickly eluted from the column. So for example, if you look at compounds 1, 2, and 3, they're eluted very quickly, their retention time is very, very short, so clearly they must be the most polar compounds. So it's important for us to know, um, based on the type of HPLC that we are doing, right, to be able to uh, predict uh, what types of molecules or what types of compounds will elude earlier and what types of compounds will elude later. So uh, sometimes it may be a bit confusing because we're talking about uh, very polar, medium polar, non-polar species. So I would uh, recommend that you be able to visualize in your mind um, specifically based on the type of HPLC column that we are using, which molecules will elude uh, first, which molecules will elude later and so forth. So this is a summary table of the two types of HPLC that we have just discussed. So we have just discussed essentially normal phase HPLC and reverse phase HPLC. And they're just opposites of each other, but both come under the category earlier I mentioned partition chromatography. So for normal phase HPLC, the stationary phase is polar, the mobile phase is not polar, and when it comes to elution order, of course, the least polar thing will leave the column first. Reverse phase HPLC is just the opposite. Uh, its stationary phase uh, consists typically of carbon chains that are not that polar. Uh, mobile phase typically will be relatively polar. And of course, 
the polar compounds therefore will elute first. Now as we consider changing the composition of the mobile phase, it may also be a bit confusing so I would recommend that uh, you'll be able to discern this properly. In the case of normal phase HPLC, the uh, stationary phase is quite polar. So if we increase the polarity of the mobile phase, then we'll find that our compounds elute faster. Right? So we have a decrease in the retention time. Of course, the opposite is also true. If we decrease the polarity of the mobile phase, so let's say we have uh, less amount of water, uh, more amount of methanol or acetonitrile, then we um, raise the retention time so all our compounds will tend to take longer to leave the column. Of course, in reverse phase HPLC, where the stationary phase is uh, very non-polar, if we increase the polarity of the mobile phase, then uh, more of the species will spend more time interacting with the column, therefore take a longer time to elute. So we will observe that the retention time actually increases. If we decrease the polarity of the mobile phase, then uh, we find that the various molecules will tend to flow uh, more quickly with the mobile phase, thereby decreasing the retention time. So it's very important at this point for us to really not focus on memorizing this table. So please do not memorize um, how changing the polarity of the mobile phase will affect retention time in either normal phase or reverse phase HPLC. What I would recommend is that if you understand um, um, which type of HPLC has the polar stationary phase, which type of HPLC has the non-polar stationary phase, you should be able to derive how changing um, the polarity of the mobile phase will affect retention time. So um, it should not be an exercise in memorization, but it should be an exercise in uh, understanding and therefore using a stepwise kind of uh, derivation to arrive at your answer. So in this slide, we present a whole bunch of different solvents that can be used uh, in HPLC. So from the top, we present um, solvents that are very organic in nature, very low polarity. Right? So uh, these are considered the non-polar organic solvents. So things like hexane, toluene, diethyl ether. And right at the bottom of the list, we present water, which is the most well-known uh, polar solvent used in HPLC. So um, there is no need to memorize this polarity order. What I would generally recommend is to know um, just the bottom three. So these are the most popular solvents that are used in HPLC, water being uh, the most polar, followed by acetonitrile and methanol that are relatively the same in terms of polarity, and these are considered typically organic solvents. So what's important, what's more important for us to appreciate is if we use a combination of water and organic solvent, then if we increase the percentage of water, our mobile phase becomes more polar. That's logical, right? Because water is a very polar uh, compound. But uh, if we increase the percentage of the organic solvents, so any of the ones that you see on the long list here, then naturally, that will decrease the polarity of our mobile phase, which makes sense because, uh, again, all of these um, solvents are non-polar relative to water. So please do not memorize the polarity order. It's just important to know that uh, increasing water will raise polarity and increasing the organic phase will typically decrease the polarity of the mobile phase. Again, uh, as we talk about the polarity of the various mobile phases, it's also important to know the rough polarity of the analyte molecules that are being analyzed. So earlier I mentioned that uh, long chain hydrocarbons, typically very low polarity, things with um, oxygens in them, so alcohols, carboxylic acid, famous water, typically very high polarity. Again, um, it's not crucial to really 
memorize this list, but I would recommend just roughly knowing that um, carbons by nature are quite low in polarity and uh, things with oxygens tend to be somewhat higher on the polarity scale. So as we uh, conclude this part on uh, partition chromatography, just one simple example, um, we have a prediction and explanation of the order of elution uh, for various compounds using a C8 column. So the moment you see a C8 column, you should uh, appreciate that this is a carbon chain, so therefore it's a non-polar column. So for non-polar columns, of course, the non-polar compounds should be very highly retained and therefore eluted later, while the very polar compounds um, will not interact much with the column and therefore be eluted much earlier. So of these, clearly we have a propanol, which is an alcohol, reasonably polar, so therefore I expect a propanol to be eluted the fastest when using a C8 column. Um, propene, which is basically a carbon chain, uh, will be very highly retained uh, on this non-polar column, so I expect propene to be eluted the latest. And propanone, which is a ketone, just one uh, oxygen on a double bond, will be sort of medium uh, polarity between propene and propanol, so therefore it should be eluted uh, right in the middle uh, between these two compounds.